Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Okay, let's talk a little tech, but we're going to take a positive spin on it because we can be negative about it. I'll hold my hand up. I'm guilty of that too. Caden Rosenbaum, one of our good friends from over at Young Voices. He's also a policy analysis. Got one of them lawyer degrees, although he doesn't lawyer too much these days. How are you, sir? Good to see you. I'm doing pretty well. How are you, Andrew? Fantastic. Good to see you. Look, I try to be a little self-aware, okay? I try to, you know, I know my own weaknesses. I work on this. I can be grumpy. I can be curmudgeonly. I can be, you know, grooved in my ways. I'm not big on the new tech. I can yell at the clouds with the best of them. I yell at the kids to get off my yard. But you went out to CES, and I liked how you wrote about it. And we'll talk about the piece you wrote for Libertas, but you took a positive spin on it. It's almost like you purposely went in. It's like, you know what? I'm going to skip the noise and the hype, and I just want to find some good stuff. Was that kind of your thinking here? Well, uh, I'll tell you, my trip to CES, that happened by accident, really. Uh, and once I was done, it, it almost seemed like that was all I had to write about because that's uh, the things that I saw, the things that I sought out uh, were just you know positive technology instead of consumer technology, so, uh, so to speak. And so whenever I got home and, and I looked at all my footage and I looked at all my my notes and the business cards I collected, I just I just had a bunch of startups who were just trying to change the world instead of you know whoever at samsung or lg or something the latest and greatest flat screen tv and so uh i sat back and i realized well the reason why i wound up at the startup hall is because that was the most interesting thing like i'm not looking to tell people to buy the next four thousand dollar tv i'm looking to tell people about what's going to change their lives one day and so that's how that's how we got to the positive spin really an accident but i'm glad it happened yeah, Caden Rosenbaum. For folks that don't know what it is, I used to live in Vegas, so I know what this is because that meant the week I'm not going anywhere near downtown, um, especially the convention center, which is where this <laughs> yeah. is based at, because this takes over half of the strip for people that don't know. For people that don't know what CES is, though, just give them the nutshell of what this is, because this is something that is, you know, this has become a media thing now. Every, you know, first of the year when CES comes out, this is four or five weeks of copy for websites. Oh, yeah. The tech blogs all send people, the major. You know, Apple usually makes big announcements at these things, Samsung, Google, whoever you want to mention. This is big doings, but explain to people who don't know what it is, what CES is and just why it's such a big deal. So the, so CES is it's the, it stands for the Consumer Electronics Show, and it's been happening for decades. Uh, I remember being really young. One of the first things that made me interested in tech uh, in general, I didn't really think I'd be a policy analyst. But back then, the thing that interested me in tech was the footage from CES. Right. You get like robot dogs or uh you know cars being 3d printed live in a matter of an hour or something um these these kind of demonstrations by huge tech companies of all the things that tech can do is always really fascinated me and maybe want to get in this space in general but for a lot of companies this is the the proving this is not the proving ground this is the demo ground it's where they show people the newest tech um i saw uh, for, for instance i saw an 8k led tv uh, as I was just passing by, didn't even realize that was a thing. And it was maybe 70, 75 inches. And it was beautiful. It was awesome. Uh, there's all kinds of VR hand tracking stuff out now. Um, there's new AR, uh, which is augmented reality glasses. And there's like four or five different companies making them. Um, this is where you go to find all that stuff before it hits the shelves. And uh, if you're a startup, this is where you go to find investors and partners and people to be your vendors so you can grow your business. It's, it's a trade show and it's there for all the consumer electronics around the world. And people like me really just go for fun. Uh, but people who are actually in the tech industry and, and building something, they go to find partners, investors, and really show off what they've got to people like me. Yeah, Caden Rosenbaum joining us. You, you kind of skipped over it, but I want to back up for a second because there's something really important you said at the start of this. Startups versus kind of the traditional tech companies. This is a sub um, this is a sub narrative in tech reporting, especially in the Silicon Valley era of the last 15, 20 years. It's it's almost like pro wrestling, like there's what's in the ring and then there's what's backstage, right? Yeah. The startups versus the big companies and the shuttling of personnel and how those are the same people over and over again. That's the subheading. That's the backstage stuff to all the performative tech reporting we do. But startups has almost kind of got a bad name in some circles now because there are startups that are just kind of money grabs and whatever. And then sure. there's the little startups where it is, hey, I figured out this really cool thing and I'm trying to get it out there. Kind of the old school uh, inventor entrepreneurship. That one term seems like we need to break it down a little bit more than just startups because it means different things to different audiences, doesn't it? 
It really does. Uh, startup can sometimes mean uh, a crypto bro who just inherited a bunch of money and he goes out and he starts this thing that's totally not useful, totally not in demand, but he's going to go ahead and start it and raise all this money and say like, oh, Google offered me 500 grand, but uh, Meta offered me 400 grand. They're, they're trying to swindle me, bro. They're trying to swindle me and it's really a useless product or something. Uh, but then there's the startups that are startups because they have a good idea. They invented something that's going to help people or it's going to be enticing to people and they decide to make a business and just go for it right those are the startups that i found I, I thought that they were the most interesting and one of the big shifts that i wasn't expecting is that a lot of the startups that i talked to didn't have the sort of nail it scale it get investors grow 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 mentality they had this different mindset where they would take their tech, they would test it in a limited capacity. And, and what they were seeking was investment so they could you know, wait, so that they could test and, and get all the kinks out. So they didn't hurt people. So they didn't produce something that was useless, right? They wanted to test first. And then they wanted to grow incrementally and, and get the next part of it right. And then grow more, right? And, and that was really a, a theme that I kept finding in most of these startups, even the ones from, uh, from out of the US, right? People who wanted to be in the US, but knew that they had like five or six different safety steps to get through before they could reliably say to people, this isn't going to hurt you, right? I thought that was fantastic. Um, it was way different from what we usually think of startups, which is just throw out a product. And if it hurts people, just sell it and get away from it, you know, sell the liability away. Uh, this was different. I was, I was pretty encouraged by a lot of the startups. And uh, one of them that I thought was really, really interesting, and it has some privacy concerns, but I thought it was the most interesting still. It, it's, it's basically an app, right? It goes on your phone and it creates a keyboard and it, you use the keyboard just like you would uh, your normal keyboard. And it just watches you type and it watches you make errors, how you interact with the error correction and just watches you. And within the matter of a week, it has a profile of you. It knows how you interact with the keyboard. And this is really important for people uh, with MS, right? Once they have an MS episode, sometimes their arms go numb, sometimes their whole body goes numb, sometimes their fingers just stop working a little bit more than they normally would. So this keyboard within a week could start watching and, and, tr and looking for these things. And within a week, you might have something that's telling you, hey, something's wrong. Uh, do you feel okay? And if you don't feel okay, you might go get checked out because something's happening with your motor functions. And the company is called Neurocast. And I thought it was fantastic. The, the person shows me, uh, he goes into his web browser and he, he shows me something. I thought he was trying to show me a website. He clicks the little URL bar and the keyboard comes up and he shows it to me. And I just went, uh, I'm not looking at anything. I'm just, you, you're in the URL. And he went, no, this is exactly it. It was sort of like he was like, no, I know what I've got, right? Uh, and he shows me this keyboard and it just blew my mind. I walked away from it and I couldn't stop thinking about it. Just, this is really important. And so there were startups like that. There were other startups trying to help agriculture. Some were pulling water out of thin air. Uh, some were trying to help with uh, trash recycling and making sure you don't pay for trash days when you don't have any trash or making sure you get more trash services when you have too much trash. Uh, I thought that, that was really fascinating. That was a startup coming out of Africa. And just walking around what I call the startup stage, it's called Eureka Park. That was the place to be. And so we made a, we made a reel and a TikTok out of the footage that I took from Eureka Park. And I just said at the very end, everybody who went to CES, you know, did you miss out? Because everyone else is taking videos of VR and, and roller coasters. And Roland had a really great exhibit with, with uh, drum machines and a drum set that looks like a normal drum set, but it was an electronic drum set. And that just, that matters for, for people like me who can afford to, to go out and, and buy fun consumer electronics, but like to the everyday person, to someone who needs a new device to help their health, or just someone who's trying to make the world better, those things don't matter. The startups were making the things that mattered. And I thought that was very important to, to point out. Yeah, it sounds too much like that uh, Adam Garcia movie, The First 20 Million is the Hardest to Make, where they had the virtual keyboard pop up out of the Jeep computer. That's what that ad made me think of. Caden Rosenbrook. <laughs> yeah. um, we talked about the perceived gap between the startups and the big companies. You'd mentioned the Eureka Hall. You talk about it in your piece. This was a physical gap. Now, again, this is one of the biggest oh, conventions yeah. in the world now. So obviously not everything's going to fit in one space. This actually had a physical barrier. I imagine culturally just in the room, I imagine that just permeated through everything when you walk around and you get to talk to these people. Was it more people focused than tech focused? Because that's something that came through in your piece. And I wanted to ask you about these startups. The thing about technology 
and you can talk about wearables or Apple or whatever you want to, whether they succeed or not is always do they connect with people? There's always the gap. Here's the tech. Here's the people. Can we get the people to like the tech? Right. I got to imagine doing it in that environment really brings that to the forefront. Uh, you know, let's just start with the physical gap. CES is way too big for even the convention hall in Vegas, which is, I, I think, one of the biggest in the world. So that just gives you an idea of how many companies go there because it's such an important point uh, every year for those companies to make it. But there were two different halls uh, that were apart from the convention hall that I really noticed. There was one that was at the uh, convention hall or something like that. It's, it's another casino in, in Vegas. And that was where most of the media relations kind of stuff happened. You know, how are you going to market Bitcoin or something to consumers? And uh, NFTs and such. And I sat in on one session and realized I was in the wrong hall. My wife is in advertising. I don't know. A, I don't know a thing about it. And so there was the other one, though, which is another show right away from the uh, main convention hall. And it was called the Venetian uh, Casino. And that was where Eureka Park was. It was two levels, but it was, you know, at least 20 minutes to get down there. So every day, my colleague David and I would get on the shuttle and go over to Eureka Park. And that was where we set up shop and just kept talking to people. But the, the physical gap is very real. And I think that, that was uh, part of what kept people from going to Eureka Park. But the other gap, right, consumers versus, uh, you know, consumer electronics that are for fun versus things that actually focus on people. I think that at the startup level, they're thinking about things differently, right? Larger companies are looking to sell more products. And that's great. It's their job, right, as a company to sell more products, make more money and increase shareholder wealth. But the startups were just looking for someone to invest in something that would change people's lives. I mean, they were they were tinker and tinker and tinker. And I saw like three or four different prototypes that they would show me their, their stages of development over the years. And they wouldn't release until they knew that they were onto something. And I, I thought that that was just a whole different mindset that you don't see at the main stages. Tatum Rosenbaum joining us. We talked about a perception gap. We talked about the physical gap, the technology gap, the human gap. There's a price gap part to this too. You touched in on a piece. One of the reasons I don't pay attention to something like CES, maybe as much as I should, those top line products, 8K and $20,000 or whatever it is. I know five years from now, that's going to be an affordable product and the technology will devolve down and it'll be a consumer project down the road. So I just kind of turn it off and tune it out. What's some of those things, though, that maybe get tuned out by people like me who's just like, well, I'll just wait until it's cheaper because that's how this always works. Mm -hmm. But we really should be paying attention to because it is pushing the envelope forward. It's not just a new spin on a TV or whatever the case may be. Well, I kind of mentioned this earlier, which is augmented reality. Um, if you don't know what that is, if you've if you've ever been in a new car and it has that pop up display, it's not real. It's like a holographic display and it shows you your speed or some you know dash information. So you don't have to look down. It's right there, almost like on the road that you're watching. That's called augmented reality. And I, I've been watching augmented reality for some years and it's always been kind of clunky, hasn't quite worked. But the overall vision is that we wouldn't have you know screens for our computers or uh, we wouldn't look down at our phone for turn by turn directions. We would see in, in real time, you know, in our real world, uh, holographic images. And that comes from the glasses, right? That's where the processor is and such. And I, I didn't think that it was there. I didn't think it was ready for the market yet until I went to CES. And there were like five or six different companies. There was one company uh, that was making the, the processor. And I still don't quite understand it because it was very complex, but had the processor between the screen and the computer that would connect AR, right? And I almost think that they had the screen too. Don't don't quote me on that. But the, the founder was from Utah and he was just a very friendly guy. And uh, 
uh, I keep meaning to look back into his things. It's very complex, but AR is definitely the next uh, frontier for technology. No longer like we, we won't have like a buzzing phone in our pockets five years from now, or or probably ten years from now. We won't have a buzzing phone in our pockets, and we won't have something distracting uh, everywhere we go. We will we'll have VR uh, and an AR that's just readily accessible, and it's going to change the way we live our lives, the way that we uh, walk through cities. I mean. I don't know if any of us still try to do math without a calculator, but now that we have calculators, our life's a lot more easy. We rely on them. Uh, I don't think that I could go back. I think the same is going to happen with AR. But uh, the other trends that I want to point out is that uh, technology is going to fade into the background, not to say it's going to go away. It's going to become more um, user-directed, right? passive kind of technology, things that aren't taking your attention. They're helping you uh, augment your own capabilities. And maybe that's turn by turn navigation. Maybe it's doing calculations and still replacing your uh, math abilities. It's going to be something like that, something in the background. And that was one of the main themes that I also noticed in the hour or two that I walked around the main stage. Yeah, Caden Rosenbaum. I think you said something really important there, though, because something like augmented reality, there's ways that it really fails. I'm thinking like meta and the metaverse and all that, where it looks like Half-Life 2 in a video game from 15 years ago. That stuff's not going to work. But if you make it, and here we go again with what we've already talked about, we keep running in a loop in this, but it's just true. You got to make it where it just integrates into people's lives seamlessly. Smartphones hit so big because they made things easier. Yeah. So the thing with something like augmented reality is if you got to log into six things in four apps, that's not easier. That's not going to work. If sure. it streamlines three or four things into one device or you don't have to reach for something and it's practical, yeah. that's when it starts hitting. That's that's exactly what I'm thinking, you know, um, uh, and especially when it comes to the the goofy tech. And I, I thought that there were a lot of tech companies there that were, you know, they were making toys uh, essentially, right? They were they were making uh, robot dogs with fur, and they were kind of lifelike. Those were fun, important tech, I, I guess. I mean, I don't know what frontier that progresses. I'm sure it does something, but some of those things, I just thought, you know. Very cool. You have holographic uh, fish in a fish tank, but what's the point? How is this going to fit into anything but a luxury lifestyle? And then, uh, then there is right the passive technology that's in the background to help you augment yourself and become something more than just a, a person who can't do math. If you're uh, anything like me, I thought that that was way more important. Uh, if anything, that the big companies did, it was to find some things that would augment or, or go in the background to just help. Right. Instead of change things or make you buy something silly. Yeah. Caden Rosenbaum. Here's here's another example of what we're talking about. We've had wearable technology for a while now. It's a big oh, thing. Yeah. Some oh, of it hits. Right. Yeah. Apple Watch that worked. Um, Fitbits. Very popular. Google Glass didn't work. Got cringy. Was creepy. People didn't like it. You had several of the things you noticed in your piece and you have a list of some of your best of here that you found. There was multiple kinds of wearables. I don't know if this is the second wave or the third wave we're getting into wearables, but it does seem like maybe these companies are learning from their mistakes a little bit. They're getting out of the uncanny valley area of these wearables, focusing on practicality. And now they're kind of starting to figure out where those lines are of, hey, if this really helps somebody, it's going to go well. And they've got some real practical stuff that they're looking into getting into here. Yeah, Uh well, just for starters, I mean, health things are really important. I think a lot of people are, uh, especially if they're able to buy wearables, they're probably thinking about life longevity and how to be healthier because they're probably in their, their 30s, maybe 40s, and probably after. I think in, in your 20s, you're probably struggling to, to buy some of these things yourself unless you're getting it for Christmas from your parents or something. Um, I, I think health is a big trend that I that I locked in on. Um, I went up to this this company that has a camera and it takes your biometric. It can it can do a selfie of you and take your biometrics and figure out if you're at risk for certain diseases. So I, it watched the pulse in my face, my pupils dilating, and it came back and was like, hey, you're in great shape. Your skin looks like you're 24, but you should probably cut out some cholesterol stuff. You should probably start exercising because you're a little bit higher risk. And that sent me on my own little journey, right? To look for some wearables that would help me with exercise or, or diet. And there was this one that I mentioned in my piece that is a, a wearable uh, physical trainer, right? It watches your vitals and it can run really high level diagnostics, but it also shows uh, you know, the motion you make when you lift a weight and if you're lifting it improperly because you don't want to hurt yourself at the same time. Uh, I thought that that was a really important tech. Um, and, and there was much more there that I didn't get to explore, but 
I think health and wearables is right now where companies are locking on because as soon as Apple released their Apple Watch with EKG or ECG technology, something that could you know track your heart rate and you can see if you're having a palpitation or something, that was huge. You know, it's got fall detection. If you fall off a ladder, it knows what that's like and it calls an ambulance if you don't pick up. Uh, that's really important for people because it helps them live longer or, or be healthier. And so I think that that's probably the thing that wearables is going to uh, in- enhance over the next couple of years. But when we get augmented reality glasses that are affordable and actually useful, I think that's going to be a major market. It's going to change the way we work, the way we live our lives, the way we go about cities like like New York, which I'm in right now. Yeah, Caden Rosenbaum. Let's talk on a lighter note, though. You were tweeting about this. Let's talk about some old school tech. If you just paint in stencil, no smoking on a wall with a whole bunch of tech <laughs> bros and geeks around, that's old school tech. I, How effective is it? See, I think uh, I think that there was a, a language issue happening there. Um, instead of no smoking, I think some people were reading it as smoking, and that was the place to smoke. But every time you left the Venetian Hall, there was the no smoking sign, and like 100 people just smoking cigarettes. It was just a big cloud of secondhand smoke. And I had to take a picture of it. I couldn't ignore it. I thought it was the funniest thing. And so I said, uh, be ungovernable. And that was all I could say about it. You know, But if if we had augmented reality glasses that could you know, interpret and spit back out in a different language what something is saying, like in writing. Uh, we already have this. We th- There's a software or a technology company out there with glasses that will listen to someone talk and provide captions, either in, in the same language or in a different language. It'll translate it and give you captions in real time, which is huge for communication. And so this whole no smoking, smoking thing might be a thing of the past in the next couple of years. We work hard enough. Yeah, Caden Rosenbaum. All right, you actually walk through the halls. One of the things about being somewhere in, in person is you don't get the headlines. Again, you know, the the press releases, people just grab the press release, spin them back out. That's how this stuff gets reported. Again, this is a pretty select slice of people because these are the insiders or the tech geeks or the people that are really into this. What were they talking about, though, that's not making the headlines? What were they discussing? What was kind of the buzz, not of the products, but just in general? When you get a group of people together, it's always interesting to kind of take a slice out of what they're actually talking about. What was what were they talking about in the halls and as you were hanging out and walking around? In the halls, I, I didn't hear the reporters, right? The reporters were writing, and that's great. And I thought it was encouraging to see them retweeting me and sending me out to bigger audiences because I wasn't sharing, you know, the next uh, smart ink cars for paint or something. But the people in the halls, they're making deals. They were getting investors. They were running through the ringer, giving their pitch, trying their hardest, uh, or just finding vendors and figuring out how they could work together. I thought that was the most interesting because I don't work in the business world. I have a finance degree. I always thought I would work in the business world, but I never did end up there. Uh, I just write and, and think about things for a living. But I got to see business people, you know, and and they make deals just like Shark Tank, but they're they're like in a little corner of a hallway, and it's just three of them, and they're running through things, and they're. You know, uh, they're being asked tough questions. I thought that was very interesting uh, just to observe and see happen because it wasn't, um, you know, if you go to a speech, it wasn't like the filler stuff you hear at a speech. It's like, we're going to be great in the future and we're going to be producing renewables by 2030. It was like, here's our bottom line. Here's our ROI. This is how we can help you. And in three years, this is what we believe we can deliver. What do you think? And then they would get feedback back. Um, That was fascinating. Couldn't tell you what they were talking about. It was all numbers. But that was the hallways of CES. And the other part of the hallways of CES was people who were just totally exhausted, like myself, by day three, uh, taking little mini naps on the, on the sofas because it, it's, it's an exhausting event. It's, it's all the time grueling, but uh, that's the hallways. That's the things you don't see for sure. Yeah, some entrepreneur needs to come up with portable cots and go sell them to CES. You'll make a fortune. <laughs> exactly. There is no tech that will ever replace good old-fashioned hustle is what you're saying here, basically. Oh, yeah. That's that's I wouldn't say that's wrong, um, but I think that it could take a lot of the burden off of the hustle for sure. Yeah. Caden Rosenbaum. This is fascinating stuff. Again, sometimes I get cynical about the tech stuff. You know, we've been we're a year into, you know, Elon Musk being the main character on social media, this kind of stuff. We can get burned out on it. So I appreciate you bringing a positive spin on it. It's like, hey, yeah, we are better off in the Middle Ages because we have indoor plumbing and Google. 
we are better off. So it's good to not be cynical about these things. Appreciate the piece. We're going to link to it. Read the whole piece. He has his list of things that he found really interesting. Let him know. I'm sure he'd like some feedback on it. Kate, until we get you back on the program again, though, let folks know where they can keep up with you, what you got going on, how they can follow you until we see you again on Hurt sure, Tell, so my friend. So if you're ever looking for me, you can go to libertas.com. It's actually pronounced libertas, but the phonetic spelling is L-I-B-E-R-T-A-S. It's libertas. Uh, you can find me there. Or you could find me on Twitter at Caden Rosenbaum, C-A-D-E-N-R-O-S-E-N-B-A-U-M. Uh, and right now, what I'm focusing on is the, the gig economy and regulatory sandboxes. I'm looking at drone regulation. And right now, the Utah legislature is in session. And one of my big focuses, because Libertas is, is based in Lehigh, Utah, is the Utah legislature and making sure that bills are up to par with what needs to happen at the states. And so if you want to look for me or follow me along, go to Twitter or uh, find me on Libertas.org. Yeah. And Utah's legislature has been really interesting the last few years. They've been crossing some lines on traditional politics. We'll have you back and talk about that sometime soon. They Some things you wouldn't think out of a state like Utah, and they've been kind of dare I say, progressive and innovative on certain things. We'll talk about you that in the future. Caden, appreciated the talk, buddy. You enjoy New York City. We'll talk soon. Thanks for having me on. Talk to you then. Thank you.